Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. So I'm going to talk uh, about something a little bit different. Um, a lot of the talks that we've heard before have really um, uh, centered around colorectal surgery. We're going to uh, switch over to bariatric surgery, and I'm going to uh, just hopefully be, ex go over some reasons why I think this is a little bit of a, a, a specific population, and I have, I have no disclosures. So um, enhanced recovery programs after bariatric surgery, as I said, I think there are some uh, pretty good evidence to show uh, that this patient population is uh, a little bit different than some of the other patient populations. Um, there, are, um, uh, there are a lot of, actually a fair amount of evidence that shows that um, uh, foods that are high in uh, fat and refined sugars um, can actually be addictive and that patients who are obese are actually have a food addiction. Um, there's some actually very interesting neuroscience research that shows that consumption of these high energy foods can actually stimulate the brain reward uh, pathway, and that actually causes addiction and uh, uh, substance abuse. abuse. Um, so that's, that's really a, a very fascinating uh, concept for me. In fact, there is some thought that patients who are undergoing bariatric surgery who have food addiction preoperatively can actually have a transfer of their addictions postoperatively to either substance abuse or alcohol abuse. So there's a fair amount of data uh, in the literature uh, that go over, go, goes over that. I'm going to just show you a few studies just to uh, uh, highlight that. Um, cro the chronic uh, use of opioids actually is shown to increase after uh, bariatric surgery compared to before, and that if you look at patients who are seeking uh, substance abuse um, uh, treatment, th there's a higher percentage of pa patients who have had bariatric surgery in that group. So this is a, this is a study uh, that came out in JAMA a couple years ago. Uh, basically, um, as I mentioned, ob uh, obesity is actually associated with a, um, a lot of chronic non-cancer pain. Uh, this was a cohort study. It involved 10 national health networks across the country, from Boston to uh, Colorado, Pennsylvania, of a lot of uh, Kaiser groups. Uh, and uh, they looked at um, a bariatric surgery database, looking at opioid use pre- and post bariatric surgery, one year pre, one year post-operatively. Uh, they used um, pharmacy dispensing uh, data to uh, identify patients' opioid use. Uh, Preoperatively, um, they used um, uh, whether or not patients were using a certain amount of narcotics in a 90 to 120 day period uh, within the one year um, period post uh, pre-surgery and then put patients in, into, into those three groups and then looked at how much narcotics they use post-operatively. Um, and um, what they found just to start off was that 8% of the patients before even having bariatric surgery were chronic opioid users. And that's pretty high. Uh, most most studies suggest that in the general population, that's about 3%. So it's, it's much higher than um, what, what would one expect. Uh, and what they found was that uh, of the patients who were chronic opioid users uh, preoperatively, 77% of those patients uh, went on to continue to use uh, narcotics and actually increase the amount of narcotics they, that, that they were using. Um, there was also a little subgroup analysis that showed that the patients who were successful in losing more than 50% of their excess body weight actually had less uh, narcotic use than the patients who, were, uh, who lost less than 50% of their excess body weight. They weren't exactly sure uh, why that would be. But uh, again, this is, I think, uh, a very interesting um, uh, point. Uh, again, this is another similar study. Uh, again, a, a multi-institutional study. Uh, this was a prospective cohort study. Um, uh, it was from a data from a data set known as LAVS, which is Longitudinal Assessment of Bariatric Surgery. Uh, and again, uh, looking at patients pre and post bariatric surgery, following patients for up to seven years post bariatric surgery, and looking to see uh, what was um, what was it. Um, uh, prevalence of uh, alcohol uh, use disorder and substance use disorder. Uh, and the way that they did this study was they used a validated tool uh, to measure alcohol use disorder. For substance abuse, it was a little bit less rigorous. It was a self-reported mechanism pre-op and post-operatively. And again, you can see here uh, from the graphs, um, they, they actually compared uh, a laparoscopic gastric bypass compared to um, adjustable gastric banding, but you can see that uh, 
primarily for the alcohol use disorder uh, um, and then just alcohol use, uh, there was really a marked increase uh, in that pre-surgery uh, compared to post-operatively and then more in the gastric bypass compared to the uh, gastric banding. There was a, a mild increase in the illicit drug use. You know, I think the limitations that they mentioned in their manuscript are related to the fact that this was self-reported, although uh, the slight increase that they said uh, that they saw were actually mostly um, marijuana use, which uh, increased over the time period of the study, and that probably coincides with just it being more available. So um, now that we know that this is a probably more of an issue in bariatric patients than other patients, um, is there anything that uh, we can do about it? So I mean, there's lots of studies that are, all the other speakers have talked about. This is just one study that was just published, a meta-analysis looking at uh, intravenous uh, acetaminophen uh, use versus placebo in bariatric patients who were otherwise going multimodal pain management. Uh, it was a meta-analysis of uh, four randomized control studies. They were all actually very recent studies from 2016 to 2018, there was a total of 349 patients combined uh, for the entire meta-analysis. But you can see here that very clearly the um, pain scores and the uh, morphine equivalent use um, in the um, IV acetaminophen group was uh, much, uh, much lower, so it decreased the use of opioids. So I think, uh, again, give, you know, acetaminophen, tap blocks, all the things that we've been talking about this afternoon, those are all can be uh, very successful to reduce the use of opioids and especially if you're uh, using it in a population like this where you are a little bit more worried about that. So uh, given all the evidence that we have uh, in the literature, um, there's been some uh, guidelines that have been published. This is from the ERAS Society. It's just a consensus uh, review of peri you know, optimal perioperative recommendations for uh, bari bariatric surgery. Uh, this was a little bit uh, older, and there hasn't anything been newer uh, since this was published. But you know, they, they, they publish all of the guidelines that are um, part of the traditional enhanced recovery program. Um, but specific to uh, periapidative analgesia, you can see that uh, they, their level of evidence and the recommendations were both uh, very you know, high and strong for the use of multimodal analgesia in bariatric surgery patients. Uh, and then subsequent to that, um, the Anesthesia um, uh, Society also has now published um, special indications for opioid-free anesthesia uh, for bariatric surgery patients. And you can see that they're listed here with a lot of other um, sort of special populations. So I, you know, I think this is definitely something to think about for those of you that are dealing with bariatric surgery patients. All right, I'm just going to switch uh, gears a little bit. So for um, just for those of you who may not be aware, the um, ACS and the ASMBS just recently um, uh, published the results of the um, quality uh, improvement project, the energy um, uh, protocol. Um, which is uh, an enhanced recovery program for bariatric surgery uh, patients. Um, it's employing new enhanced recovery goals to bariatric surgery. That's where they got um, energy. And um, it's, it's a traditional um, enhanced recovery program, just similar to all the other ones that you've seen with all of the pre-op, intraoperative, and post-operative uh, elements that we're all very familiar with. And you can see that, again, a very uh, strong emphasis on intraoperative uh, reduction in um, opioid use, um, as well as using a basically a non-narcotic pain regimen postoperatively. So none of the patients get a PCA at all postoperatively. They can only get it, you know, on, you know, if they ask the nurse for it. And, um, you know, I think this was um, a really, uh, I think it was a great uh, uh, protocol. Um, I really actually enjoyed using it at our program. These are all the, the uh, centers that were chosen to be part of the program. There we are at, down at the bottom, and all of the centers that were chosen to be part of the program uh, were chosen because they were noted to be high outliers for um, extended length of stay or readmission. So um, that's how uh, we got uh, uh, placed in this group. <laughs> so our, our weight management program uh, is over uh, two hospitals. Uh, so we have one area where we do our clinics. There are four surgeons in our group um, that do, depending on the year, anywhere between 150 to 200 cases. We have a full uh, multidisciplinary bariatric uh, group, um, which is actually uh, works very well together. Um, uh, and really, we, the reason that we were chosen because we had we were a high outlier for readmissions. Um, and um, for those of you who again who are familiar with bariatric surgery, the um, uh, the uh, the ACS had come up with a, a, a similar 
uh, ERAS program called DROP, and we had already implemented a lot of those uh, elements before um, the energy protocol, so many of them were actually already in place when we uh, started the energy protocol. But really, our main uh, goal was to, to reduce um, um, our uh, readmission rate and, and make, make patient care uh, improved. Uh, again, all, all of the elements that we talked about, the pre-op, intraoperative, and uh, post-operative uh, uh, elements, uh, specifically, I think the biggest changes were related to um, the intraoperative anesthesia protocol and then the post-operative um, pain management. And the intraoperative um, uh, uh, IV the intraoperative anesthesia protocol really was um, supposed to be no no narcotics no no narcotics used intraoperatively. Now, well, I will say we did have some issues because since we do our surgeries across two you know, high volume academic centers and you don't always get the same team in the room, especially from the anesthesia team. You had some, sometimes you'd get an anesthesia team that were very familiar with the protocol and sometimes you'd have someone that really uh, wasn't that familiar with that. And so I think that was really our main barrier. And for any of you that uh, are looking to potentially uh, implement this at your program, that's something to think about for sure. Um, this just basically uh, goes over, you know, what our biggest issues were, and in our case, um, like I said, it was getting everyone in the anesthesia team on, on board. It wasn't that they were interested in being on board, it was just that there were, there were so many anesthesiologists and CRNAs, et cetera, that it was really hard to get everybody um, educated appropriately. Um, uh, we definitely had uh, the buy-in from the administration um, and the administrative support um, that, that we had our MBSA QIP um, data collection thing, so all of that was uh, fairly easy. Um, and like I said, we were usually doing most of the protocol already, so that, that was not, um, it wasn't that hard to implement it. Uh, this is just an example of what the uh, monthly audit report would look like. You get a uh, report every month um, showing how you're doing with all the different elements of the protocol. Uh, and again, here you have, it's a pretty well-designed uh, system. You have the MBSA QIP that's responsible for analyzing the data, the center, that's us, for uh, entering the data and giving it uh, uh, to them for analysis. And then you're also assigned a mentor that goes over your uh, monthly audits um, on a regular basis. So. We uh, just uh, finished about two months ago. This was the uh, this was our last uh, month's um, uh, audit, and you can see even though this was going over one year, we still were not at 100 percent for a lot of the elements, and and a lot most of them were really related to um, the, the issues with that we had with education between us and the anesthesiologist. So you know, ideally we would have. A, you know, 100% in all of the your site, and, and we did not achieve that, unfortunately. Um, so as I said, this was just uh, presented at the um, uh, Obesity Week. It's The manuscript is, uh, uh, from what I understand, already in uh, publication, and um, uh, the, it, it'll presumably get posted on the ASMBS website, so anyone who wants to implement this protocol will have all those uh, materials available. So anyway, in conclusion, I guess uh, I just want to make sure that everyone again understands that I do think the enhanced recovery uh, protocols for bariatric patients, there's plenty of evidence that demonstrates how important it is, uh, specifically in the bariatric surgery population. There are guidelines uh, for this. Uh, there's data that shows that it actually works, and hopefully as more data becomes available and more buy-in uh, from hospitals that this will become sort of standard of care. So thanks very much. Thanks, yeah. That's great. Perfect.